I'm Stephen Markold from OpenCast, and I'm here to tell you about the state of the OpenCast project. So the OpenCast community is people who care about video and academic video, and doing that in a way that reflects the values of open source communities and exchanging our experiences, knowledge, and products. And OpenCast has built a video management system which is primarily been focused, but is not limited to uh, lecture capture. So OpenCast is firstly open source, obviously. Um, it's highly flexible. It's a solution for the video needs that come up in higher education. Um, people use it to produce lecture recordings, and very importantly, to preserve and manage video. So you get video in. You do something with it, you process it, you distribute it, but you need a sense of keeping video as an asset, not only as something that you're pushing through a pipeline. And that's a very important aspect of OpenCast and one of the reasons why institutions should invest in it rather than just look for an immediate product that does a distribution pipeline. Um, academic video is important for students. We know this. It's highly valued by students as a learning resource and flexibility. And it's important for institutions because it's an asset. It's reusable in some cases. It's um, a record of instructional activities and a cultural asset in some cases, video that can be preserved and more widely used. So in David Wiley's terms, uh, lecture recording is a solution to the invisible ink problem. A lecture that's an event that happens once off and then it's finished is like the ultimate disappearing ink. You can record that on video. It gives it a longer life and more uses for it. But OpenCast is not limited to lectures and it's not limited to education. It can also be used for a whole range of different situations which involve video processing and distributing and storing it. So here are some examples from NCAST, which has worked with clients across a range of sectors. Video is used for formative assessment to record students interacting in clinical scenarios, for example, either real or in simulation. And you can play that back and use it to reflect on how students have performed. Um, it can be used in very high quality studio environments to prepare educational content in advance. It's not a live event. And it can be used to communicate special events to a broader, wider audience. OpenCast is used um, around the world with a footprint in the US, quite a strong footprint in Europe, especially in Germany, Spain, and the United Kingdom, and some adoption in Africa. Um, at our last count in 2014, we had somewhere around 40 adopters who had registered their information on the OpenCast website, and there are at least 30 additional uh, <coughs> OpenCast Matterhorn users who are using solutions based on OpenCast through one or more um, commercial partners. So we could be somewhere up to 100 adopters using OpenCast technology, and that number is growing. So what is OpenCast? We uh, have a structure that will probably be familiar to you if you're familiar with Sakai and other um, projects in the Aperio stable, with a couple of differences, given the, the nature of the domain that we work in. So there is a, a board, which is a fairly lightweight structure that looks after uh, project communications and initiatives such as unconferences and meetings. We have a group of committers, which functions very similarly to a committer group in other projects. Um, contributors, obviously, you don't have to be a committer to contribute code, ideas, or design. There's a community, which is also involved in developing projects that work with OpenCast in a complementary way. Um, a strong group of commercial partners, and some of those are sponsors, and then some related projects that are designed to tie in with the OpenCast ecosystem. So this one slide is an overview of what OpenCast does and shows you the elements of a video solution. Um, at the top, we have how your video comes into being. So on the one side, there are possibilities around lecture capture in a very automated way. You can have a set of capture agents, and OpenCast can be used to schedule time-based driven recordings for those, and the video is automatically pulled in to OpenCast for further processing. There's a rich and complex capture agent API that allows those capture agents to talk to the core, 
But you can produce video from any source, in fact, and pull it into Matterhorn to OpenCast. So if your video comes from any other solution, um, there are a couple of ways of pushing that into OpenCast and then applying a workflow to it. So the second step is ingest and processing. And this is really the, the heart and the strength of OpenCast. It is workflow driven, so you can define a set of transformations and analysis that will happen to your video. Um, those can be simple things like combining a video and, and an audio track. They can be an analysis step like doing um, character recognition to get a text based representation of video slides, um, audio normalization, combining videos in different ways, and transcoding it for different output formats. Then there are distribution options. You can publish video from OpenCast directly into an internal distribution route, which uses OpenCast's own video player, which is multi-stream. Or you can push it out into your own video distribution channel. So that could be an external service like YouTube, or you might have a video portal on campus, or a CMS, for example. And as long as there's a defined way to publish media into that, you can configure and extend OpenCast to um, put your video there. But a very important step of this is the archive step. And you would put this into a, a workflow so that once you've done distribution, you're preserving a, a high fidelity copy of your video. And in future, you will want to do something further with that video, potentially. So um, video, in many ways, is a rather fragile technology because the formats are changing quite frequently and the device support is changing. So you might find in 2020 that you have a set of new devices, the latest cool phone that will only play H.265 video, for example, and your H.264 MP4s will stop working. So you need the sense of video as an asset, something that you can re-ingest and reprocess and update and refresh and push out to different channels as you need to. So that's a major strength of OpenCast, that it will preserve your video in a manageable format and preserve rich metadata along with it. And the last step of that is engage tools, so the playback. Um, Matterhorn comes with a multi-stream player, which will play two or now more side-by-side -side videos. Uh, and there are a couple of ways of integrating that into other systems. You can use LTI, for example, single sign-on. And there's a rich set of REST APIs. So some of the project milestones that we've gone through this year. Um, a big one is a Perio incubation. And we're pleased to say that this is, um, we've finally graduated. The OpenCast 2.0 release that's coming up in a couple of weeks is going to be licensed under the Aperio Foundation with the ECL2. So that's been um, a journey that's um, been about a year, I guess, in the making. And we're pleased to finally have ticked off all the boxes on there. Secondly, we are simplifying the branding and communication around OpenCast. And one aspect of that is retiring the name Matterhorn, which was essentially a project name. So if you've come across this previously, you might have heard a distinction between OpenCast, the community, and Matterhorn, the software project. And we are now simply referring to all of that as OpenCast. And we'll be launching a new website and logo with that. We've also redesigned the user interface to follow a consistent theme and a lot of other big um, changes, which I'll talk about. So the Matterhorn code, if you, are, if you have worked in Sakai or some of the other projects, you'll find this extremely familiar. It's using almost the same tools and processes as other projects. So the code governance largely follows the Apache model. Decisions are taken by committers, and new committers can be proposed and elected by the existing group of committers. The OpenCast code is in Bitbucket using Git and using the Gitflow branching model, and issues are tracked in Jira. There's a detailed, um, explicit development process around how new code comes in through pull requests and peer review process. And we've successfully transitioned to a date-driven release process with a major release every six months. So OpenCast 2 will be released in June 2015, and we have a Sorry, that date is wrong. Um, 2.0 schedule for June 2015, 2.1 for December 2015. And we have a feature roadmap, which goes about um, 6 to 12 months in advance. 
So we more or less know the contents of what will be in the uh, OpenCast 2.1 release. So there's some degree of predictability about what you can expect to see released. Um, that's been a, <coughs> a, a determined effort to get to this and quite a valuable and worthwhile one. There's obviously some pain. Everybody wants their favorite feature to show up in the release, but I think people have come to accept the pain in favor of the discipline, and that's been a good outcome for the community. There's a flourishing commercial ecosystem around OpenCast, and because we are in the video and audiovisual equipment space, this is very important. So the first part of that is capture agents and hardware. Um, <clears throat> there's a, quite a spread of vendors who make either capture devices or through to complete um, capture appliances, and including total end-to-end -end solutions. So for example, at the um, one end of the spectrum, you get cards like data path capture cards that are widely used and known in the community. And at the other end of the spectrum, you get solutions like that provided by NCAST, which have um, capture devices that will stream and capture and ingest to a presentation server, which itself is built on OpenCast. So these devices come in the form that you want to buy them in, depending on what your strategy is what your AV integration needs are, for example. You can buy an appliance that slots into a rack, um, and you can build your own capture agents, for example. So um, the vendors here are either of a close working relationship with OpenCast, or they've added OpenCast compatibility to their devices so that they can register with the OpenCast server, know when to capture media, and provide it to OpenCast in an appropriate way. Um, the second part of the commercial ecosystem is contract support and development. So in a similar way that you might be aware of vendors working in the Sakai space, there are a couple of companies working on the OpenCast side. And if you decide to adopt OpenCast, um, you want to deploy it yourself, but you want particular features or customization, or you need help with implementation planning, these companies can give you that type of assistance and make your deployment successful. So the major vendors in the space are Entwine and Tiltec. Then there are also complete um, hosted services. So there are broadly two types of hosting. The first one I've described is client hosting. That includes um, an entire solution. I mean, you obviously capture the video in the way that you capture it on your own premises, but uh, OpenCast instance would be provided for you and managed and run for you. So I know certainly of hosting solutions from Entwine, Encast, and Teltec, and there might be others that are popping up. And then the hosting models for a defined user community. So in this category, we have, for example, Switch, which is the Swiss Research and Education Network, and they provide a lecture recording video service for a defined membership. Um, OpenCast facilitates this because it has a multi-tenant configuration. So it's very easy to set up a hosting environment that is serving multiple institutions and clients. Um, another milestone that we're quite proud of in the community is our first crowdfunded development project. And the goal here was to modernize the OpenCast OSGI technology stack. We had some components that were a couple of uh, versions behind. And it's the type of problem that really takes in-depth work by a group of small people rather than superficial group by a large distributed people. So Entwine proposed this project to the community, and they put in a cost estimate onto it, and they invited contributions. And I'm pleased to say that we reached that funding goal in about 10 weeks, and that work is now going ahead. So we think this is one of the, a couple of different models by which features and development works, um, and it's a very encouraging sign that there's a, a core group of committed contributors who are willing to support efforts such as that. Um, then we have some sponsors, and our two um, big sponsors at the moment are Datapath and NCAST, and the contributions from sponsors help to support project activities particularly in quality assurance that improves the product for everybody. Um, there are quite a few products around OpenCast that add value to it in different ways, and I'm going to mention four of these. Um, the first one is LectureSite, which is an automated 
uh, camera tracking solution. And this used to be a problem that was only solvable with a very large amount of money. LectureSight is an open source solution that uses um, PTZ cameras to follow a presenter around using image recognition and direct the camera in real time. And I'm just going to show you that in action. This is the OpenCast YouTube channel. So we and if I play uh, this, you'll see. Whoops, sorry. Kind of where we are currently. need to move um, that across really to phenomenal. So we started out with 10 equipped lecture theaters um, with the lecture capture technology contained within them. And, uh, and then we started to increase that after okay, two years so of this pilot. Is University so of somewhere Manchester. around about 200 now, um, and then by semester one. Uh, next, uh, in September, October, we'll be up to 300. And this is totally automated. Uh, so There's the, no the kind of human intervention going on there. capture agents that we've gone across from there. When you look um, so the application of these technologies is making a whole new level of quality possible at uh, an affordable cost, which is really just the hardware cost. Um, this used to be an extremely expensive case space to deploy solutions into, and I think OpenCast has fundamentally changed the economics there. Um, let me go back to these slides. Right, the second one is Paella, which is a HTML5 player that, in fact, dates back a couple of years. And it's an example of how you can implement different delivery methods as long as you understand the OpenCast media package format. You can write players that will play back media from OpenCast in a couple of different ways. Uh, the third one is an implementation of a capture agent in Python called Pika. And it has an interesting story because it was written to run on the Raspberry Pi as an extremely low-cost capture device. And it's subsequently been used for a couple of other applications as well where you can control any device that has a REST interface. So this Pika is like the smallest possible type of capture agent that will listen in to the server uh, trigger something to start a recording process and then send video back into it. So there are lots of options around the capture space, and I think one of the major goals of the project was to break the type of lock-in where you had a tight coupling between capture devices and the central core. So OpenCast gives you the freedom to mix and match as you need to. And the last one there is a, a desktop-based capture solution that runs on Windows. If you want to record uh, a Windows desktop and a webcam, for example, that will do that and ingest it into OpenCast. So I'm going to briefly talk about five institutions where OpenCast has been deployed to give you a sense of the different choices that institutions have made and how OpenCast enables that type of flexibility. Um, the first up is the University of Manchester, and I would encourage you to look at the OpenCast YouTube channel, which has presentations about their experience. This is a very large-scale deployment, and they have around 200 capture agents with plans up to about 350. It's an opt-out model, which means they record lectures by default, unless somebody has requested not to be recorded. Uh, it's highly automated and very high volume, and been very successful. Um, they built their own capture agents running Gallicaster. Uh, the second one is almost completely the opposite model. This is the Harvard Division of Continuing Education. And they record uh, presentational video in a studio environment with very high production values. So they work with professional AB hardware to capture the videos. They push it into OpenCast. They recently moved their OpenCast infrastructure into Amazon Web Services. Um, which improved performance and throughput because of the very high performance that Amazon is able to deliver, and particularly on um, I.O., which is a little counterintuitive to hosting it yourself. Um, and they're very active contributors to OpenCast and have a number of ex experienced developers on the team. The third one is the University of Cape Town, where a mid-sized deployment of OpenCast with um, sort of getting up to around 50 venues. We have a sort of do-it-yourself deployment, and we have built our own capture agents working with Gallicaster. Um, so that's an Ubuntu-based um, capture agent running on essentially desktop PC hardware using data path capture cards. And we have support contracts with Teltec and Entwine that um, give us additional capacity or solve problems when we don't feel that we have the time or expertise to tackle them internally. 
Um, Osnabrück is a pioneer in the early adopter space, and they have a very successful model of using uh, student projects and um, postgraduate student work in particular to innovate in ways that not only are successful as student work, but actually become core production usable projects. So a lecture site of the new HTML5 player, for example, and some other ones have emerged from Osnabrück through research and development work that is really cutting edge. Um, the last one is University of California, Berkeley, and they have been in the um, webcasting space for a very long time. They recently modernized the technology that they use using OpenCast and have decided to publish to YouTube as their publication channel. Um, so between those, those universities, you can see dis different decisions that have been made around how to capture video. They would all use slightly different workflows around how to process it, and there are different decisions around distribution and access. So what's coming in OpenCast 2.0? Um, so a big leap forward is a reconceptualized and designed user interface. So if you've looked at OpenCast, um, the 1.6 version, what you have is an administrative interface that sort of reflects the underlying services in a technology model, but is not very intuitive to users until you sort of understand how the guts of the system work. That was completely redesigned and built to present a sort of intuitive, conceptual, mental model to users around video and its life cycle. Um, the second big feature here is an HTML5 multi-stream video player. So that replaces the current flash based player, which has device limitations, obviously. Um, a couple of other changes, like support for extended metadata and workflow and efficiency improvements. So talking a little bit more about the administrative interface, um, and it's a little more than admin, it's a sort of management interface. Um, there's really a transformed user experience there. It allows flexible roles. So we wanted to introduce the role, for example, of video producer, somebody that is responsible for sort of the life cycle of a video from capture to presentation, but is not looking after the whole system. Um, <clears throat> So it's customizable for different roles depending on what, pe what relationship people have to the video. It's designed by Espress Labs, and it's actually a fantastic example of redesign in an open source project that produced really compelling, effective user experience as a result. So Espress Labs was commissioned by Entwine um, to do the visual design work, and Entwine built the interface um, in Angular JS, and in fact, Entwine was in turn commissioned by a couple of institutions that put investment into this work. And the translations are in Crowdin, so currently there are five language translations, and if you would like to provide a new one, then you can go to Crowdin, <laughs> and we encourage you to add that. Um, so we believe that this really makes um, OpenCast much more accessible and intuitive and easy to use for new adopters. Uh, the second big change is this HTML5 multi-stream media player. So uh, it has some new features like variable speed playback. In this configuration, you're seeing it playing two video streams. It could actually play three or more up until some limit of you're, you're running out of CPU power on it, obviously. Um, you can jump around in the player to slide tracks that are automatically segmented based on changes in the slide video. And at the bottom, you can see there's a, a text version of what's in the slide, which has been generated by automatic character recognition, and in this case, in German. So it's um, in a particular language detected it. Um, there's quite a long list of features that's planned for OpenCast 2.1, which I won't go through in detail, um, but it's, I think it's an indication of how much momentum and uh, energy there is to the community. I would say as a project, um, OpenCast is sort of medium size. It has uh, quite a uh, good group of core developers. It has quite high maturity around processes. It's been around for a while, even before its superior incubation. Um, and it's really approaching software maturity, I would say. So OpenCast 2.0 will be a release that's quite polished and it's got a lot of the rough edges and performance issues dealt with. 
Um, if you want to get involved, this is probably a bit maybe too small for you all to read, but I'll go through the types of channels that there are. There's the Opencast website, which we expect to update in a couple of weeks to make it a little clearer to find your way around. There's uh, three mailing lists, a community list, which is quite low traffic, a users list for implementers and adopters, and you can go and ask questions about Opencast itself or related technologies, cameras, AB hardware. And then there's a developers list, um, which is a little bit more high traffic. There's an IRC channel where developers hang out, Opencast. Um, you'll find the source code in Bitbuckets, the issues in opencast.jira.com. And there's a brand new documentation site, docs.opencast.org. It's still being populated, but has moved the documentation into a more structured, organized way from the wiki, um, which reflects some of the characteristics of all project wikis, which that over time they become a little less focused than they ought to be. There are also weekly uh, technical meetings that are held in Big Blue Button. Those obviously are not um, required. They're voluntary participation, but whoever there is there talks about technical issues that's coming up, and people loosely coordinate, although the sort of reference discussion happens on mailing lists and in issues and um, on pull requests. And then there are monthly adopter meetings, which also happen in Big Blue Button, and we have um, at least one major event a year, and we try to align with other events where possible. So there was an Opencast Community Summit in Manchester in March, and almost all of the session videos from that event are up on YouTube. So if you are on YouTube and you just search for Opencast, um, you'll find that event, and it covers a lot of these new um, initiatives and technologies in more detail. So these are the two most important things. You can do this now. Send an email to matterhorn-users plus subscribe at opencast.org. And if you have further questions, you're very welcome to mail the list and sort of figure out how, Matter how Opencast can be useful to you. Um, so we have, I believe, a little bit of time left, about 15 minutes perhaps. And I can take questions, or I can show you things. OK, any questions? I'll take that to mean this was totally comprehensive. <laughs> right, thank you all for coming. And we look forward to seeing you in Opencast, seeing how we can help you meet your video needs. Thank you.